episode 45 for the 6th of November 2013. I'm your I'm Crash. And I'm Steve. And I still can't get it right on the video. I guess I just <laughs> clam up. Anyway, intro music time. <laughs> You know, sometimes I think there's just too many things for me to look at. So, ah, and it's starting over. Jeez. All right. Yeah, we got um, we had to narrow this down some. It sounds really weird from my end too. Oh, like the it? music goes, wow, like someone's dragging the record. Huh. That's strange. It just might be the delay in the the this the internet machine. You know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'll I'll have to listen to it in the final recording. See how that sounds. I know it sounds fine onto the actual audio, but I don't know about the the broadcasted thing anymore. I don't know about anything anymore. Today's already been crazy, and then all of this. <laughs> so, I guess we'll get this out of the way first. This episode of the Cafe Racer podcast is sponsored by... The Motorcycle Sport Touring Association. If you love touring riding, MST, MSTA is the place. The Motorcycle Sport Touring Association is a national organization with members and events throughout the United States. The MSTA was founded in 1982 and is chartered by the American Motorcycle Association. The primary purpose of the club is to bring together riders whose focus is on motorcycle sport touring regardless of the type or brand of motorcycle. We believe that enjoying the road along the way is as important as the destination. Come visit us at RideMSTA.com. Now, I know you actually know a little bit more about them than I do, because you are one of them. Yeah, I'm a member. Uh, it, it's a really cool organization. The club that down here that I'm a member of, uh, these guys are riders. You know, They'll do uh, like a 200-mile lunch ride, if not more. And uh, they they'll, they'll, they do Saturday rides. I try to go to a, as many of them as I can. And that's the good the good thing about it too is it's not kind of focused on any kind of bike. So the last one that I went on, the lead rider was on a, a Hayabusa. Nice. And you know, some of the guys are on your typical sport tours like ST thirteen hundreds, FJRs. But then there's guys on smaller bikes too. So it lends itself well to a group of guys on cafe bikes that wanted to go for a long re weekend ride and maybe throw a tank bag on, you know, because sport touring is kind of a broad category, really. Yeah, definitely. You know, and boost is considered a super sport. You got, there's a lot of ADV bikes that are doing it. It's a good group. Check it out. Um, if you have any questions specifically, drop me an email. I know that the, uh, they do a couple national rallies that are pretty neat, and they do these just for fun rallies. So there's a lot of opportunities to get together and do rides. And they actually met. They did a, a ride for Barber too, and I didn't go with them because we didn't take the bikes. But they met at a, a lodge and then did a bunch of the roads in the Alabama area. So it's a it's a great organization. I, I've been a member off and on for a bunch of years. Cool. I uh, this is actually the first I've heard about them. I, I think I heard you talk about them a little bit, um, just in conversation, and then Jim uh, contacted me about sponsoring, and it looks like a cool little group of people. I mean, even that thing that I did on my Bonneville, you know, around the western states could have been considered sport touring or whatever, if you want to call Absolutely. it. Absolutely. You know, you it's you got a bunch of bags on the bike and uh, took off on a trip, and it's not a classic tour, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, that it, it would have fit really well into that group. If you can find, you know, when when you end up down south, if you can find an MSTA group down there, you should definitely check them out. Yeah, I will. It's uh, it's it's nice sometimes to ride with a group. I mean, I've done all of my traveling by myself so far, but. Sometimes I've gone. You know, it'd be really, it'd be nicer if I had somebody to talk to along the way. Yeah, it was funny is um the the ride I did because th there's another group here in Florida that was called Riders of the Lost Empire. It was mostly guys on Brit bikes, 
and uh, I rode with them for a really long time, and then that that kind of went away. And but they they do their rides in conjunction with the MSTA rides. So when MSTA puts a ride out, one of the the guys from that group will send an email out, to, and you know it'll be a kind of a mixed ride. So when I rejoined the MSTA after being out for a while, and uh, went on one of the Saturday rides, it was to the middle of the state of Florida for for like a brunch and they had like a starting point which was in Palm Beach County where they say hey you know empty bladders and full gas tanks by this time we're leaving at this time and they and they have like half hour up the road they'll do a rolling stop <clears throat> so that's where I was gonna get picked up and the rolling stop was supposed to be at like 730 in the morning I remember getting out there, and it was right off the Lake Okeechobee, and there's a, a lock out there run by the Corps of Engineers. I don't know if you know anything about Lake Okeechobee, but Not it's really. the center of the state of Florida. It's the big body of water you see when you look on a map of Florida. Mm -hmm. And there's a canal that runs, all, that dissects Florida, or bisects it right through the center of Florida from the east coast to the west coast. That's how they do a lot of the, the shipping and stuff back and forth. But there's a set of locks that run that, that canal through Lake Okeechobee because the water level changes. Because the lake is really how they they uh, you know s store the water table for this for the state. Yeah. So anyway, that those locks are run by the Corps of Engineers, and Port Maca is one of them where we did the kickoff point. So I went out there early in the morning, took some pictures. It's kind of nice out there when the sun rises, and. Um, knew that I had to be at the pickup point by 7, so I kind of like 10 or 15 minutes before, I drove around to where the road was, and here's this guy sitting on a, a Triumph um, trophy, a brand new one. And he's got, you know, flip-up helmet, he's got a comm system going, I introduce myself, we start talking, find out this guy's been a long-time member, he's the editor of the Florida newsletter, and the Triumph trophy was new, it was a 2013 I I, I want to say that he got it in January and has already put like 38,000 miles on it. Wow. So this guy's been out to California, done a bunch of riding out there and back. And all he's they're all linked up by CB and we're kind of talking. He's like, oh, here they come. And the rolling stop was like not really a stop. It's just we pulled in behind these guys. Yeah. And the ride was really, really nice. Brisk, uh, nice pace through a lot of twisties. All back roads up into Sebring, none of the main road, which was a lot of roads I'd never been on. Yeah. And it was a lot of fun. It was good. We had a really good time. So I'd encourage people, listeners, if, to check out MSTA and see if you've got a group in your area. And, and it doesn't matter what kind of bike you ride. They don't care, you know, at all. So. Yeah, definitely check it out. And uh, in case you want to hear that URL again, it's ridemsta.com. Cool. Um, I think we'll push the other sponsorship to the middle-ish part of the episode today. So uh, let's see what else we got to talk about. I know that the AIM Expo happened while I was down in San Diego and working my butt off. But Yeah, that was yeah. really... I think that was a big success. Um, it sounds like it. So I went with a buddy of mine who's in the market for a motorcycle. And he, he's not a new rider. He's ridden years ago for a long time and he's owned Harleys in the past so we went up it ran the week and then ended on a Sunday and it was open to the public starting on Friday evening actually Friday afternoon I don't think they advertised that really well at one o'clock on Friday they had the the outdoor section and that's when they had they had demo rides going on nice so we kind of like found out the schedule there for the last minute. I didn't go to any of the the press stuff or the dealer stuff earlier in the week. I just didn't have time. Right. We rode up on uh, on Friday. Was it Friday afternoon? Yeah, Friday afternoon. I can't remember now. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> That's what happens when you get old. So, and it might have been Saturday. Either way, we got there and... Um, got to do a demo ride with Suzuki and Yamaha and what was really cool is I got to ride the new FZ09. Oh yeah. And he rode one too and then with Suzuki he rode a the, I guess the the newest version of the Gladius which they don't call it a Gladius anymore. Yeah, I don't even remember. It's some letter SVS number. SVS 650 or something I can't remember and I rode the 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 DRZ 400 which 
I, you know, I, I was really excited about riding that bike, and I was kind of disappointed when I got on it because it's smaller than I thought. Yeah. I, I think, first of all, you know, my weight being like 245, I sat on the thing and compressed the rear end completely. I didn't <laughs> think to crank up the shock at all on it. Yeah. And it just feels small. It feels like I'm on a little bike. You know, and I, I thought it would be like dirt bike height, but because it's the SM version, the Supermoto version. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a smaller all-around bike. But it was fun. But riding the FZ09, oh, my God. What what a great motor on that bike. How does it compare? I know you've got the, the Tiger 800 in the, in the garage. How does it compare? A lot different. When this thing, well, first of all, the bike's lighter and smaller. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's not as buzzy as the Tiger motor. For, that To me, that, you know, and I know that, I've heard other people talk about how much they like that the motor in the 800. I, I don't know. I'm just not a fan of it. To me, it, maybe it's the bike. Maybe it's the whole thing, the whole package together. It just feels kind of buzzy. This thing, past like 6,000 RPMs, the bike just ripped. There's three modes in there. There's a standard mode, an A, and a B mode. And I, I went right to the A mode and had a lot of fun on the bike. Now, obviously, you're on a demo ride. You're not going to be you know, going crazy, but... They did give us a couple sections like, hey, we're going to leave the light, we're going to leave it pretty quick. If anything happens, you're on your own. You know, was this the like was this the kind of setup where you're on a sort of organized ride together? Yeah, you're you're okay. leaving on an organized ride together. They've got a leader and and somebody you know running at the back, and it's the same. If you've ever been on a demo ride like at Bike Week or anything similar to that, that's how it was. It wasn't on a closed course. It was out on the road which was kind of cool. So you, you left the convention center in Orlando and were out on the city streets and came back. But uh, but it was fun. That being said, that bike, to me, would lend itself very well in a cafe format because we sat there and kind of purposely looked at it and looked at where things could come off and taking you know the rear turn signals off and things like that, and there's a lot that that bike could lose. Then I guess now they've announced that they're going to do the same version in a 700 Oh, really? Which, to me, the bike actually looks a lot cooler. I saw pictures of it on the web. and uh, I've been so out of touch, touch the past, like, three weeks. I, you, like, I noticed, I see you posting stuff. I'm like, oh, this looks cool. This looks cool. I should probably have found all this stuff, too. Yeah. You know what, man? You're busy. It's work. and I'm, It's going to be the same thing's going to happen to me probably soon where I'm going to be... There's a grant deadline coming up for me, and I'm going to be stuck writing a grant that will take forever. So yeah, you. I mean, you've been really, really lucky with these these events lately. Have been like really close to you. Um, I'm yeah, hoping, that's really the only reason I went. Cause, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm hoping that when I move down to San Diego, I'll have a similar situation. I mean, because Long Beach isn't going to be that far away, and that's where the one of the biggest uh, Cycle World IMS you know right. things happens and. That sort of timing-wise, this year I'm kind of screwed out again because the Long Beach one is in December, and I could probably go, but it's still a lot of money to pay to get there for a day to turn around and come home. Right. And I move yeah. in Feb the beginning of February, and that's when the Seattle one is. It's in the middle, middle of February. Yeah, if AIM would have been another trip like Barbara, I wouldn't have went, you know, because that was a hotel and travel costs and everything. This was just. I mean, we had a hotel room, but it was, you know, a two-hour drive from my house. It wasn't a big deal. Plus, there was stuff we wanted to see. There, there was, yeah, you know, I posted pictures. The, the, um, a lot of really cool new helmets out there. The, the new Bell Bullet was really neat. I actually got to mess with that and touch it, and the quality of that helmet is incredible. The interior, the uh, suede that they use is really nice. Their redesigned 500, which I, I could never wear one before. Try right. the new one on; it fit perfectly. I have issues with mine. I mean, I love the way it looks when it's not on my head, mm -hmm. but then it does this thing like when I if I don't strap it down and then ride for a few minutes and wait for it to creep up and then shove it down and strap it down even harder to so the point where I can't even really open my mouth. Um. Yeah, you're gonna you right up and it was like bubble on top of my head. No, it'd be a completely different experience. You're gonna like this a lot. Hopefully, we got a couple of demos coming. But uh, also, torque their helmets for you know these these things are like in the sub hundred dollar price point too, and uh, they had some really new cool designs on there. The one 
thing I thought was the coolest thing I got to mess with was the new Senna S20. Yeah. The Bluetooth. Because um, the cool thing about that is they came out with an action camera. And I actually got the, to, you know, touch the unit itself, the comm right. unit, which it, it, now the range is extended. It's got a flip-up antenna. Everyone's been, like, speculating, oh, what's this weird little piece in the back? But it's actually a flip-up antenna. Yeah. It increases the range. The, the, the design of it's not a lot nicer. It's easier to use. But here's the really neat thing about it is it'll control the Bluetooth camera by voice. So you can set the camera up remotely. Like, let's say you had the camera set up <coughs> on your fork leg of the bike, someplace you can't reach it. Okay, so other competing cameras have a handheld remote. So you have to mount that someplace to be able to start and stop the camera. This thing, you can do it by voice. The really cool thing also is, is that there's no microphone on the camera. So you're not picking up any wind noise. So you can actually narrate through the comm on the camera while you're filming and have the music that's being played in the background muted out because they use the process, and I, I, I should have had it with me here, what, what they call it, but it allows to have those channels running at the same time, kind of like you, you have on your phone when you're having listening to music and then you have like ways or maps come and give you a direction where it'll it'll mute the music a little bit and then yeah. give you the instruction. This thing does the same thing. So the camera that I held was still a pre-production prototype, and I don't believe they've actually come out with the published price yet. So that was kind of cool. But uh, y you know that if if you're into that kind of thing and you like to to shoot videos while you're riding, and that this is a neat setup. I like it yeah, a lot. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I like the... I, I've got three different action cameras, and they're all slightly different form factors. And depending on where you're going to mount it, they all seem to work a little different, like a little better than others. Like the GoPro. Right. Because it's shaped like a regular point-and-shoot kind of uh, film camera or digital camera. Mm -hmm. um, but it's real small, you know. Like it, it has this big face that you know. When if you try to mount it on your helmet, you end up it ends up sticking out really far or whatever. And that always bothered me. But if you're going to mount it on the front of something, then it's a great you know location, right. like a right. chest mount or the front of your motorcycle or whatever. But like all those ones, like the new Senna one that are kind of skinny and long with the camera, you know, facing when the camera it doesn't lend itself in. well to that. Yeah, I, I have a, a Contour which is even longer. Yeah, Contour HD, so that doesn't lend itself well to a chest mount either. But this it does is, work on a side of a helmet. Yeah, no, it works nice. And here's the cool thing about the Senna with the GoPro, is they actually came out with a piggyback for the mm -hmm. GoPro that allow you to do the same Bluetooth control. No. Oh. Because they use, you know, the, it's not any type of proprietary connection into the GoPro. It's, I guess it's a Bluetooth fitting. I mean, a uh, USB fitting, so this thing just connects and... I kind of had said, oh, so do you guys, like, license this with GoPro? They're like, no, we just made it. Nice. And it works, <laughs> yeah. That That's was cool. kind of cool. And uh, the other standout stuff from AIM that I thought was pretty neat was, again, the uh, Ace Cafe there. Uh, I don't want to say that, I don't know if the announcement's official yet about where the Ace Cafe USA location is. Yeah, I was going to ask. It's I'm going to tell you, <laughs> probably shouldn't even say this because I don't think they've made it official, but everybody kind of knows. It's Orlando. Yeah. It's going to be in Orlando. So we're super excited about that here. Um, they're hopefully targeting sometime next year. It's uh, the location, which we were really hoping it wasn't going to be like the uh, touristy area of International Drive. It's not going to be there. It's going to be... Yeah in a different area, and it's an existing property, which I hope they stick with because it looks a lot like the Ace Cafe from northern London. So uh, we're excited about that. There's there's some really uh, big groups of guys that are cafe racer enthusiasts in central Florida that I know are really happy about it. And I just those guys had a really cool display set up at, uh, at AIM. It's the, the Cafe Moto Club from Orlando. Yeah. And... Uh, some phenomenal bikes, so I'm really looking forward to when that happens here and, and getting up there with those guys and going to the grand opening. 
Yeah, that that's really cool. I'm I keep uh trying to figure out when I'm going to plan a trip back over to the East Coast to visit home and then to go visit all over the other places that I now must go. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny because we started this whole adventure with me being on here bitching about how nothing's going on in Florida. And <laughs> it turns out everything is going on in Florida. It's just, it, it, you know, and it was funny because when I did the roundtable, you know, I think James had commented, like, why would they do that in Florida when there's really not that much you know, of a riding community there. Why would they pick Florida for AIM? They were talking about the AIM Expo. Right. And it was the thing for, it was packed for one on the consumer days. I don't know how the dealer days were, but it was packed on the consumer days. Yeah. Um, you know, I think Florida is a good riding destination. It's just that the roads here are lousy. You know, they, there's just no variety in the roads. But as far as people owning motorcycles, you know, our riding season is pretty much year round. Mm -hmm. I think Floridians themselves tend not to ride in the summertime just because it's so hot, but other people will come here, you know. And then the cafe culture here is 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 huge. There's so I, I was so inspired by seeing the bikes that these guys from Cafe Moto Club had because it was like, oh, man, I, I could definitely do that. So now I've been looking for, you know, some inexpensive uh older CB to just, because if, if I'm seeing guys that are building these things that aren't builders and they're doing it, these are regular guys like us that did this in their garage. They took a yeah. bike and started taking stuff off of it just like they did, you know, before and then personalizing it to their own. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. So it, it was neat. It was a good time. There's a couple more events coming up in Florida that are smaller that are posted on our Facebook page. So hopefully... If you're in the area, you know, you can make some of these things coming up. This weekend, I'll just real quick talk about the uh, the one that's going to be in the Tampa area that, unfortunately, I'm going to miss. But it's called Scorpio Vintage, R Vintage Rides and Art Show. It's this weekend um, at the Saki Bomb Bar. It's uh, there's a We have a link to it on our Facebook page, but I'll, I'll make sure it's up again. And it is starts, I believe, early in the morning. This is a big deal. The guys from Dime City will be there. There's uh, Mo Colors. It's it's pretty cool. I think Iron and Air is sponsoring it. It's the block party starts at 11 a.m. They've got live music running from noon to midnight. But uh, they're going to have a pinup girl contest, vintage bikes, art show. So it'll be cool. The 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 art show and all that, the the the, the bikes and everything is like from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. But that's the Scorpio Art and Vintage Rides show, hmm. and I'll make sure we have the link up again on our Facebook page. But that's going to be in the Tampa Bay area. Sounds and like then, something to check out. Yeah, the, there's some more cool stuff coming. We'll wait till a couple episodes to talk about it. But there's some stuff coming in Palm Beach and then down in Dania. I know of nothing going on in Washington. But that doesn't mean there isn't anything going on. There's probably something you've going on that I don't know about. Much, that's all. What's that? So you've just been working too much. That's all. <laughs> You're right. I was gone for like 20 days. And, oh boy. <laughs> it, couldn't have, it really couldn't have happened at a less opportune time, I don't think. It was like right before college classes started for me. So right. I had to do... Uh, almost three weeks of an in-seat class online with no, like, with next to no teacher interaction. It was just like, hey, here's the homework. Have fun. Um, yeah. Fortunately, she was super, super understanding. So I, I think she said she's retired military. So I guess, you know, she gets it. Yeah, and that little temporary duty that you had, that didn't help either, so. Yeah, so... Hopefully things will get back on course. I feel like we're talking. We sound like the pace now, talking about. Oh well, things will get back on course and we're back to a regular schedule. <laughs> um. So let's see. What else? There's. Uh. I saw you posted on the Facebook page this thing about small displacement Harleys, and it's been getting a lot of conversation over there on our Facebook page. Yeah. What do you think about that? Um. I think they look pretty cool. I don't like the wheels. Um. But they really remind me a lot of that. Uh, Yamaha or Star Bolt 
the bolt. That's the first thing I thought of that. And it also, I saw one of those, by the way, a, a real live one. Bolt what'd you think? Down in San Diego, I think it looks good. Um, I was, I'm, I mean, there's some things that I would want to change, but that's just because I want to change well, everything. You know what's funny about that that bike is when I first saw it, I, I was kind of underwhelmed. I didn't like like the seat to tank junction. Well, when we went to AIM, there was uh, Yamaha Star. They had the Bolt build off there, and they had all the bikes there from that. And I couldn't quit looking at some of them. You know, there there were some really cool bikes, and even my buddy Rob had mentioned the fact that wow, you know, I keep going back to this and looking at it. What they've done also, which I think is really smart, is they had one there that was built up with their accessories that, that you can get right from the dealership. Oh, nice. So it's just, it's not, you know, it's not a custom guy built this thing. It's like a, here's the stuff you can buy off the shelf. Yeah, and, and it looked kind of like a little bit of a different bike, and the price of all those accessories was like 1600 bucks. That was oh, it. That's not bad at all. No, so if you, especially if you're going to add that to the price of financing. Yeah. So if you're going to go in there and you, you go, I want this, this, and this, and that's the way the bike's going to look when I pick it up, and I'm going to roll that all into one package, that's kind of cool. So, I, you know, I, the more I looked at the thing, the more I liked it, and I sat on a couple of them, and I'm like, wow, this, you know, it's not that bad, because I'm not a cruiser kind of guy, but it's not really, I don't know what you'd call that, like a power cruiser kind of, you know? I don't, it's, it's, it's really similar to a Sportster. Yeah. Um, I don't know what a Sportster is either. Other than, in my opinion, an amazing scrambler or cafe platform. Okay, and that was the other thing too. Is they had a couple of them that were done as scramblers. That I was like, oh wow, this is cool. The the Rook bike, the Jesse Rook bike, was really neat. The who did the scrambler? Now I can't remember, but they were, you know, obviously the the builds from the the professional builders are, you know, above and beyond what you're going to get normally. But the right. one that they had that was accessorized, that was pretty cool. I mean, I definitely have something like that. It was neat looking. Yeah. The Harley now, you know, like I, you said, the first thing I kind of thought about when I saw it was um, Japanese motorcycle. Yeah, it does. It definitely looks, to me anyway, yeah, like a, which isn't, I'm not saying that's not a bad thing, but it, it just doesn't immediately say Harley. Right. So there's a couple, there's some other versions of it that I saw when I was, like, looking at the, the ones that we posted up on there. Right. There, there was a white one that is not going to be a production model. It's It was just a build. And, I, you know, I realize it's not going to be a production model, but the, the cool thing about that is it kind of shows the potential of what can be done with the bike. Yeah. And I, I, I kind of like it, you know. I, I mean, there are guys that are looking at these things and they, they hate them. And I don't know. Maybe it's because they're they're Harley purists, or they they understand a certain you know look it's supposed to have. But the the Harleys that I always liked were the ones that failed. You know, the XR and the Cafe Racer. Yeah, those are the ones I thought were the coolest bikes, and those are the ones that did the worst. So I mean, looking at it, looking at the picture again, I mean, it's got this it's got this radiator on the front that's unusual. For you know most Harleys, and then the seat kind of looks like that that XL twelve hundred seat. Right, that's the first thing I thought of too when looking and at the, that in the rear the end. The tank is like nothing I've ever seen on a Harley. I don't know. So one thing I'm curious about that I haven't been able to figure out or not is they're made in the plant in India, correct? I I guess I don't that's what it looks like. <laughs> are they not Harley Motors? No, I don't know. That's a good question. I'd have to do some more digging that I'm not necessarily prepared to do at the moment. Hmm. Well, it's saying here it should be assembled in Kansas City, Missouri for the U.S. market. It says that they're, they're calling the it an... They're calling the engine an all-new Revolution X V-Twin, and maybe it is a like a Harley-designed motor. So here's a really good thing: the MSRP's 
are going to be $6,700 for the 500 model and $7,500 for the 750 model. Wait, $7,500 for the 750? Yeah. Can't you get a Sportster for less than that? Uh, I thought the cheapest Sportster was... Or may, I mean, I could have... Maybe I'm wrong. Or it's, it's no, cool. I think they're... I think the 883 is... Hold on, I'll tell you right now. Yeah, I was going to say, yes. <laughs> well, go to the internet. Yeah, the, the the magic of the internet. I'll tell you right now. I, I actually I, I made a joke about that earlier to my my teacher. We were, we were having some technical difficulties in class today, and she's like, or, and, and I said, well, you know, I, the thing that I like about technology is that if I can Google it, I don't have to remember it. And she goes, unless you have to remember it for a test. It's like, yeah, good point. Oh, you don't have open computer tests, open Google tests? <laughs> Well, she had, she had asked me like if I'd had any trouble with the ho the homework, and I said, well, actually, to be honest with you, I looked up a calculator online that would automatically answer some of these questions for me just to check my work. <laughs> and she's <laughs> okay, like, okay, so the Iron 883 starts at 83.99. Okay. And mm. let me say, I don't know. If the super low, low is 80.99. So. Okay. Uh, it's five hundred dollars cheaper than the cheapest Sportster. Are you seeing that? I'm seeing eighty-two forty-nine for the Super Low. Starting really? At, yeah, Harley Davidson USA. I was looking. Maybe it's because I'm looking at twenty thirteen models. Okay, yeah, I'm looking at two thousand fourteens. So yeah, um, seven hundred dollars cheaper than. Right. The, now I, you know, and I, I don't know. You know, this is so. It appears to be a water cooled engine. Is that a radiator or an oil cooler? I'm not 100 percent sure. Unless Is it partial that's a partial giant, water cooling, you know, like just the heads, maybe. Maybe, but that's a big radiator. That's a big grill to be covering just an oil cooler. Yeah, yeah. And you know, the like the exhaust kind of reminds me of, you know, a Japanese bike. Not, again, not that that's bad. It, it could be a cool looking thing and. If somebody wants, you know, a Harley Davidson, and they want a smaller displacement bike that they can kind of cafe out, this looks like it's in the right, the right direction. It's not going to be for everybody. No. You know? But hey, that's the wonderful thing about bikes is because the Continental GT is not going to be for everybody. The Thruxton is not for everybody. So, I and I, you know, we've talked about this in the past. I kind of see the the cafe bikes of the future being these, like the FC09 and this this 7 that they've got coming out, Yamaha. Yeah. You know, just called it FC07? I think it's something else. Oh, is it the MT07? Yeah, the MT07. I think I, I saw a picture of that. Um, did you ever, did you see, or do you remember the MT01? Um, it was a European market only um, I think a thousand cc bike that looked really similar to this MT07. <clears throat> I definitely I like that MT07. I don't remember though. that? No. Anytime you say 01, all I can think about is a DN01. <laughs> and that's a weird looking motorcycle. Yeah, and that's the uh, they took a, I think they they took a DN01 and made it have sex with an ST1300. And made that's the CTX 1300. Yeah, that's how the <laughs> CTX 1300 was born. Yes, yes, I, I'll agree with that statement. I guess one thing that actually happened already today, um, that sadly I was not able to watch because I was in class, uh, was the Cafe Racer TV show came back finally. Yeah, yay! Finally. Yeah, I mean seriously, like I was, I was really starting to get grumpy. You know, a couple months ago when I was about six months ago when I'm like, all right, they said it was going to happen, and then nothing and nothing, and right. I started putting out feelers to the people that I kind of knew, and they're all like, yeah, it's velocity. They're just, you know, spinning their wheels or whatever. And well, that's 100 percent true. It. You know, <clears throat> yeah, no, and I and I was even watching the first season again just because I was bored, so. Because there was some really cool episodes in the first season, but the uh, yeah, it was tonight. It, very so very you, happy you, about you that. You said you watched it, right? I did watch it, and I, what I can tell you is the new format's fantastic. Good, good. It's that's much that's better. That's yeah. what uh, 
That's what they were saying, is they're really excited about the new format. And in case you haven't watched it yet, it's an hour-long episode now. There's two builds, uh, start to finish, you know, like from the salvage yard to the street or the barn, you know, to the customer, however you want to think about it. It's, it's, and the focus is more on the bikes. Um, right. The, the less about, I, I've, I've been told anyway, because I haven't seen it, um, less about, um, like, I don't know if the cult, less about the culture, I guess, and more about the bikes. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't know if they're going to keep that uh, without talking about the culture anymore. But, you know, they, the one thing that they did keep that I'm really, really not happy about are the Bostrom Bully Brothers taking everybody's bike <laughs> and trying to wreck it, you know. So, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I like Eric and Ben a lot. Big fans of both of them. But, yeah, they made, an, they made a reappearance, which was kind of cool. Let's go. I mean, I guess you can kind of use them as. I mean, aside from the fact that they're enthusiastic about everything, um, you could, if they were normal, not enthusiastic about everything, people, you could use them as okay. These guys are racers, and if they enjoy this bike, then it's probably a pretty good bike. You know, whereas if another bike, they're like, oh, this is really shaky. I don't really like it that much. Then you could say, okay, well. You know, they right. know bikes. They know what it feels like to ride a good bike. Yeah, they genuinely look like they're having fun on all the stuff that they're riding. So, they, uh, you know, I think both of those guys like to ride no matter what. I, I think yeah. that, you know, if, if they weren't racing, they'd probably still be out as much as they could carving it up. But it's cool. You guys, They'll like it a lot. Like I said, the format's good. Um, the stories are good. The bike builds are really cool. They, I'm hoping that they do, you know, some more um, smaller builders, and they focus on hopefully in the future some affordable builds. That's something that where I hope we start talking more about. There was I met some guys at uh, at Barber that are builders that do really, you know, something you and I could buy yeah. easily. So hopefully one of the guys will have and be able to interview or maybe do something like on this Google Hangout. Yeah, I'd, talk to the guy. I'd, I'd love to do that. Something else that is in the works, um, and by in the works, I mean like we've talked, me and the, uh, the the guys from Dime City Cycles have talked about it, and they agreed to do it. We just have to sit down and actually do it, is to sort of give a basic, like, how, not not like how to in the every nuts and bolts sort of sense, but like a general, like, how to get started if you've mm -hmm. never done it before. Um, sort of like beginner's guide to making a cafe racer. I, I'm 100% confident I can take everything apart. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I know I can have a pile of parts in the garage. I'm sure of that. Yeah, I, 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 did that, I did that all the last three weeks on the aircraft. We're sitting there taking stuff off, and then I'm like, oh, crap. How does this go back together? <laughs> When I was a kid, I used to do that to bicycles all the time. You know, I'd have the frame, like, I'm all happy. There's the frame sitting there, and I'm like, eh, what am I supposed to do with the rest of this crap? But Yeah. Or you get it all together, and you're like, all right, why do I have all these extra parts? Oh, you're not supposed to? I thought yeah. those were like the... Now, that would be cool. If we can do that, that would be great, because that that would be a learning experience for me. Yeah. You know? <laughs> totally non-motorcycle related. We've got a guy who we took down there with us to San Diego who's brand new to the Navy, and... I was one of the guys that went down when we tore this thing apart. And so I kind of had a good idea of where everything was supposed to go back. And we put all the, it's called soundproofing. It's just sort of like this this layer of stuff that's like the ceiling above the, you know, this separates the actual components from you. Um, and it's we, we put it all in, and then he's like, okay, what do I do with this bag of bolts and nuts and stuff? And I was like, oh, those are just, I mean, they have a place, but we're not going to find them yet. <laughs> <laughs> we had we had a guy, a similar story in the fire department. One of the girls I work with was talking about her cassette player didn't work in her car. Yeah. And she was kind of upset about it. It's going back a while, cassette player. I'm sorry, it was a DVD player. And he's like, I can fix that. This They called this guy the fixer. Well, he takes her dash apart, you know, gets the module for the radio out, which most people can can do relatively easily and then put a new radio in. Yeah. Brings that radio in on the kitchen table and completely dissembles the radio. 
Oh. So yeah, it takes it all out, all the components to get to like the drive mechanism. Yeah. Where the, the CD player is, and then he puts it all back together again. And I, the God's honest truth, there's extra parts that he says, well, you know, you don't need these. Puts the thing back in there, and her air conditioning doesn't work. <laughs> so then he's like, oh, I forgot to connect something back up. So he connects it back up, gets the whole thing back together again. And she's like, yeah, it works fine. Like six weeks later, she tells me, well, it works fine until I stop where I'm going. Then I got to pull the fuse out for the radio because it won't shut off. <laughs> she's been, like driving around for six weeks, stopping, pulling, reaching underneath, pulling the fuse out. And I can't believe you let that guy take the thing apart. But Wow. Yeah. It was free. Yeah. yeah. We did a bunch of troubleshooting on the aircraft of random uh, issues that we had, and they left to fly home. And, you know, you and I had been in pretty good contact and um, about, you know, when the thing was coming home and that sort of stuff. And I'm uh, getting ready to get on the plane, and I get a text with a photo in it, and it shows a, a an accelerometer and a connector just <laughs> dangling, <laughs> not connected to it. And he goes, the text goes, is this important? <laughs> And I was like, uh, next time you land, just plug it back in. Right. He's like, well, is it going to do anything now? You didn't want to tell him that to land, though, right? <clears throat> What's that? You didn't want to tell him that he needed that to land, right? No, no, it, it was the air crewman in the back, and he's like, he's like, are they going to need this? And I was like, ask him if they have any, uh, if they ha if they're having any issues with anything right now, other than the known issues that we already have. And he's like, yeah, they're good. I was like, cool, just plug it in when you land and turn power off. <laughs> So what did you think of this thing? My uh, oh, back to the the Harley since we like oh, yeah. rat rat hold again. Some of the comments were, it, it seems to be very polarizing. You either like it or you hate it. Yeah, um, I, I noticed that. Um, that's that's kind of the way it is with a lot of a lot of motorcycles. I mean, they're especially you know specialized motorcycles. They're very. I, I don't know, like, it's polarizing, I guess, is the, the, the best word for it. And speaking of that... The Bruff the Superior? Oh, my God, is that thing ugly. Oh, man. I, I was going to say, I mean, is that, does anybody love that? Yeah, there are people that have commented that they like it. Oh. I mean, <laughs> somebody posted on our page, this must be a joke. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, you know, and I, when I saw the... the the remanufactured re Bruff Superiors at at um, Barber, I thought they were going to do something a la the bullet, you know, mm -hmm. bring back the bike. Now, this might just be a exercise in style that they're doing. I, you know, I, I don't know. First of all, how many are they going to sell at 100K? Yeah. I, you know, because they told me the bikes at, when, when I asked the price of the ones at, Barbara, the guy was like uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay, they're handmade, one ofs, whatever. I'm thinking they're going to come out with a line of bikes that would have been, you know, sub ten thousand dollars, and so, somewhere similar to Triumph. They're going to bring the brand back, but I don't. For me, I, I know that there's a market out there for people to spend high dollar on motorcycles, but they're not going to sell a lot of them. You know, you're not going to be another Triumph. No, definitely not. Marketplace doing that. I, I don't even think they're going to be another Norton with their giant debacle. Yeah, well, that remains to be seen what happens with that. I'm kind of, I don't know if they're going to survive. If, if what I've been reading, you know, you read stuff in the British press, but they're not real friendly to them. No. You know, it's, we'll see what happens with that. Um, it's a shame, too, because I thought the bike looked really, really cool when they brought it out. Yeah. And, uh... You know, that would have been something I would have considered. But now, reading what I'm reading, I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with it. Yeah, I mean, that, that um, thing was kind of, from a, from just a, you know, a component standpoint, is sort of, was sort of like all of the random upgrades that a lot of people do to their Triumph Bonnevilles mm -hmm. already on the bike. Like, you know, front and rear suspension, all that sort right. of stuff. It's much, a lot more like the Ducati Sport Classics. Uh, the other thing too that somebody sent me was these aluminum chassis. Did you see this? I do. Yeah, I, I I looked at it and the actual website, the the Indonesian website, is you know impossible to read because it's in Indonesian. Yeah. But 
I I'm, I'm I can't see I get, the the headline mentions um, aluminum chassis kits for Sportster and Triumph made in Indonesia. I see a Sportster motor in one. I'm just curious about the Triumph one. Is it the same frame? Well, here's what it says. It says it's also available for the Triumph Bonneville Hinkley. Only the body kit to transplant on the original chassis. Oh, so is it just the... And then it says, and for the Triumph Meriden? Meriden? Meriden. Meriden yeah. Which I don't know that much about Triumph. It says Triton Complete Kit. Okay, so the, the Hinkley Triumphs are the new ones. Okay. Um, like mine. Um, the Meriden Triumphs are not the original, original one, but like the 60s and 70s ones. Okay. Um, there was a factory before that. And I can't remember the name of it, but yeah, Meriden was a location of the factory. Now the factory is in Hinkley, so that's the. Then again, I mean, you might as well call mine the uh... every day. <laughs> Say again. I said I learn something every day. Yeah, the, you you could almost start calling the new Bonnevilles the. I think they. I think it might be Indonesia. It's either India or Indonesia that they're made now. Um, that's where mine was built. Are they building something in the United States? Um, not that I know of. Okay. But I, I'm frequently wrong. So. Uh, but yeah, the the I don't I don't know if they're Indonesia or India now or Thai Thailand Taiwan. Now I'm all confused. I'm gonna have to look that up. <laughs> I think now that I think about it, it's Thailand. I think it's Thailand. Um, where my my Bonneville was made. So there, you know, it, the where I found this story, somebody had sent it to me. Yep, um, Thailand. There's some talk and discussion in the comments after the story about the frame. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I I mean, they kind of look neat. I don't know. Uh, you know, if that's something I would do. I'd. I'd have a hard time. I'm not really sure I like the the gas tank either. Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of the bo most of the bodywork, but even the frame. Like if somebody, if somebody was like, "Oh, we've got this, you know, aftermarket frame for your Bonneville," I, I have a real hard time trusting the Indonesian part of it. Yeah, I don't know. And then what if you have a problem with it, you know? Yeah. It... Have you have you seen the the Street Master stuff? Um I think that's what it's called. Um they, they make a an aftermarket frame for the Triumph Bonneville and it you it's sort of a a flat tracker frame. No, I haven't but seen it, that. It's over at streetmaster.net. Um and they've got a couple of bikes um that they've sort of, you know, pre-outfitted to give you an idea. And then you can also just get a rolling chassis, so it comes, you know, just the the frame and the wheels and all that, and the forks and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but they've got a uh, an aftermarket hydraulic clutch plate, like completely redoes your clutch, so you have a hydraulic clutch instead of a cable clutch. Um they're the guys. This is this is the same company that is doing the um, Triumph flat track race bike. Yeah, these are kind of cool. Because um, the Triumph is back into flat track racing again, um, and they Streetmaster is the company that does the frame for them. I really like that bright. Range of like thirty two hundred bucks. Yeah, they're they're not cheap. The rolling chassis, fifteen thousand five hundred dollars. Yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, but yeah, just in, they're just a real. I think it's a really cool look, and they they've got a. Um, they're the ones that do. I think they're the ones that do the. Um, yeah, so subframe oil cooler. Like if if you look at my Triumph or, you know, any any of the other ones, there's this big oil cooler that sits right behind the two down tubes on the frame. Mm -hmm. And there's a way to do this mod yourself, but you can buy it from them where it turns your subframe into the oil cooler and gets rid of that oil cooler. 
Oh, that's kind of cool. It adds yeah, about a at it right here. capacity. Well, that's neat. Yeah, there's some guys on the forums that have done that themselves. Um, I don't think I'm going to do it at all, but it does look good. Maybe one day. No, this is cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah, for like 900 for bucks, too. Or, yeah, for 850 bucks, I'm definitely not gonna pay them to do it. But they do some cool stuff. This is, uh, you know, these are the kind of things I like to see. Though, are these affordable? You know, I mean, that, that's a relative term for some people. Some people think spending a hundred dollars is is excessive, but um, you know, these mods that you can do to the bikes to to keep them looking uh, personalized, I guess I would say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of that stuff is in the excess, like the the fifteen thousand dollar rolling chassis thing. Yeah, to me, that that may that may be the for a, a race ready chassis though. I'm, you know? yeah, I'm not really sure exactly what that entails. Well, if you're cool looking at what the, what it's coming with, yeah, that's including a custom wheel cooler, aluminum hubs. Let's see. I don't know that. It's just styled in the tradition of golden era flat track racing. Who knows? I don't know. Yeah, I know that it's got that typical flat tracker kind of frame shape, but. That's all I really know about the deal. And they look nice, the bikes that they've done. They, um, I don't know, getting back to those other those other bikes, if you, if, or those, uh, that other company with the chassis kit, if you start seeing this coming out from more probably American companies or North American companies, you know, it, it, this would probably be a popular alternative for a guy that wants to take, like, maybe a, um, you know, an 80s or 90s sporty and change it into something that looks more like a cafe bike. Yeah, definitely. If this would have been available at an affordable price when I had my wife's uncle's Sportster, I probably would have kept it. Yeah, it's similar to the, um, like the Rika, you know. Yeah, exactly. The, you know, there, uh, might be, there might be these things out there on a small scale, too. I don't know. Like yeah, that's entirely there. possible. I know there's a, there's a small-ish scale all aluminum swing arm for the Triumph Bonnevilles, but I don't know any more than that, really. It exists. This is kind of... And I, and I've always liked the way that bike sounded, you know, the Sports Turn. I like the motor on it. Yeah. I just never liked the style on, on any of them, except now that the newer ones, the that... um. I think it's called the 72, or what's, there's two versions of it they have. That, there's a 48, I think. And a yeah, 7. I think one of them's got like eight hangers. That might be the 72. But, um, you know, there's always been something about the Sportster that I like. Yeah, uh, let's the 48. See. The 48, I think, is the one that I kind of thought was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I sort of like that bike. Yeah, I do too. I mean, it, it looks nice. And I've seen some really awesome stuff done with Sportsters lately that, you know, make me think that one would actually be worth buying for something. Where before it was completely, you know, not even a question. What's the Thruxton run? Like right under 10, right? Yeah, I think so. I'll yeah, so this 48 is starting at 10.7, you know? The tanks yeah. are tiny on these things. I know that. Yeah, like three point three gallons. I thought it was maybe even smaller than that. And like looking at the one that they've got on their page, I'm not a really big fan of those staggered pipes like that. I like when the pipes end up parallel together, or they, or maybe like more like a uh, um, a tracker type pipe. I don't know how high you can get with those based on where the oil tank is. You know. Yeah. The. Uh, but, Thruxton is nine thousand ninety nine at MR MSRP. Okay, so they're close to the same price. This is a little bit more. There's a little more engine too, though. Yeah. I'm not sure what power, you know, what the difference in power is, um, but it's something to consider because that forty eight's a twelve hundred, mm -hmm. and the Thruxton's still an eight sixty five. 
So there's a rumor I, I kind of heard too that the XR may come back in, in one of those smaller displacement bikes as well. That'd be cool, like an yeah. XR750. Yeah. I mean, I kind of they're already kind of going in that direction. It seems like with some of those concepts that they did, but that would be neat. Yeah, definitely. That's a bike that I've always found very attractive. The uh, I think the first time I really ever saw it was there was a there's a kit you can get from Storz Performance, like mm -hmm. S-T-O-R-Z, um, that's a kit to turn a regular Sportster into a chain-driven XR, like, replica. Yeah, I've seen that before. So listen, here's another thing that came out. This was something that came out at, at, at Milan, at ICMA, mm -hmm. was they showed... Uh, images of the KTM, the RC390. Oh, Did yeah, I saw that? that little thing. Yeah. Even more angular than the, you know, than the super bike that they have, but this is going to be a cool little bike. Yes, definitely. This makes me wish I weighed like 150 pounds, you know? <laughs> but like, it, looking at it, like it looks like you'd fall off the front of it. You know, like, it's it's such a wedge shape, you know, driving down to the front. Like, it looks like you'd get on it and just slide over the tank and tumble yeah. off the front end. So, this, you know, this is, if you take, look at this bike and kind of imagine that whole entire front fairing not being there. And, you know, like, a single headlight and a bikini fairing on it. Yeah. With that definitely. trellis frame, the, the, the subframe in the back. I'm I'm waiting to see you know how, what happens after these things are out five years and a couple guys have stuffed them into like curbs you know and the plastic's all shot and they ripped it all off and this is gonna make for a cool little bike. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm I'm looking right now to compare that to the 390 Duke. Um, I mean obviously the Duke is much more upright. Yeah, they're just different, you know. I love little bikes like this, though. I'm, the yeah, Lana's more... coming out with, what, are the 300 now? or Yeah. Yep. I need, like, 12 more bikes. It's official. <laughs> well, and speaking of that, uh, Honda came out with a new VFR. I didn't really read a whole lot about it, being that only except it's a lot lighter and it's got traction control. Is it a 1200? Yeah, no, it's an 800. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, VFR 800F. Um, they came out with, you know, an SP version of the CBR and some more middleweights, CB650s. A 650F and a, a CBR 650F. Hmm. So they, and of course that abomination called the CTX... So they really hit it big with new bikes. They've been like, for you oh, know, and an NC too, a 750X. It's sort of, it's kind of crazy. Like they've gone, you know, back in the 70s, they had like three bikes at every displacement level. Right. And then it focused down to where they had a 600, an 800, a thousand, and a 1300, and that was about it if you're not talking about cruisers. And then they dropped, you know, some of those even. And now they're starting to get back to that point where, you know, if you want a 500, there's three different choices. If you want a 600, there's like six different choices. And, and I just wonder, though, are like are these going to replace anything? Like, for instance, obviously with this 300 come out, is the 250 going to stay or are they going to get rid of it? Is, it? is it there to fill some race class or are they just going to change the class now so it'll you'll be able to race both the you know CBR 300R and then the the Kawasaki bike you know what i mean is is are these intended to replace same thing with the uh, with the CTX with using the SC 1300 motor are they going to keep the 1300 around now that they're still using the motor or are they going to just end it i mean that bike's pretty long in the tooth it's been around yeah. a long time you know and it's expensive now that bike sells for eighteen thousand dollars. It's 
I don't know how many they're selling, but you know the CTX thirteen hundred really that is that is that actually the same motor that's in a ST thirteen hundred? I yeah, thought the, that longitudinal V four. Really? Yeah, I had one. I, I, huh. I didn't realize uh, that. That that bike kind of looks like the a F six B or. Yeah, it kind of has that F6B because it's got that short little stubby windshield right? and no top case. I mean, there's some people that really like this motorcycle, you know? I don't. Neither do I. I'm, it, it looks like it, it, it's got so many of the styling clu- cues from a DN01. I just, you know, that, the, the seat that. is looks like a scooter seat on there. Yeah, and it's got that riding position of like... You know, like a cruiser. You know, like a Harley Bagger. Yeah, it's just. I don't. I don't get it. Well, you know, you're also talking about. We think it's okay to ride around on clip-ons all day, so. That's true. Yeah. I, I rode for like 4,500 miles on clip-ons and rear sets. Yeah. So, yeah. I just this thing is. It's not even, to me, it's not even my older person days bike. I mean, I think one day I'll probably end up on some version of a Goldwing, but yeah, I don't, not this thing. This thing is like... No. Yeah. I guess my something new that I learned was that the ST1300 had a V4 in it. Yeah. You know, that bike... When I first rode one, it's like the second year it came out, was in Daytona at a test ride, and I'm thinking to myself, man, this thing is a missile. You know, it's cool. Huh. It's got I guess a neat they do sound completely to it. cover that motor up with bodywork. Yeah. You'd never know. No, the only thing you see are just parts of the, the valve covers. Yeah. You know? And those, like, kind of like shark fin wings that stick out the side of the ST1300 are like engine guards <laughs> that are hidden under there. The bike was cool. I, I, it's just it was boring as all get out for me. I, I said it was like riding a vanilla ice cream cone. It was just, you know, it did everything right. I on the back roads, I'd be doing 130, not even know it. But it just it didn't really do anything for me. It had a lot of engine heat too. There was a couple on the forums. There was a couple guys who were doing mods where it required you to take out the inner panels. Um inside the fairing behind the front wheel and you know there were some people saying hey that lends structure to that whole section you got to put it back in and just drill holes in it make it look like Swiss cheese I just kind of like put up with it for a while yeah but the the only reason why I traded the bike in is I was just bored of it you know I didn't look forward to going and getting on the bike there was no you know visceral connection to it at all. There's some guys that love them. You know, there's guys that are iron butt guys on those bikes. It just wasn't for me. Yeah. I, I felt similarly on a couple of bikes that I've test ridden where it's like, you know, you go out, you test ride a bike and you're like, you get off it and you go, man, I really want to ride that again. I want one of those things. Or if in my case it was the Yamaha uh, Super Tenere, I got off it and just went, eh, okay, sure. Yeah, I rode a buddy of mine's too. I felt kind of the same way, and that's like that's how I feel on the Tiger. You know, it's okay. I'm not really. It's just uh, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have been a bike I would have bought for myself. It's my wife's bike. You know, she likes it a lot. She likes Is that the XC? White. No, it's not an XC. It's a so it's standard. the regular. Yeah, I've ridden the regular one, and I actually felt completely the opposite. I got off that going, "Wow, that was a lot of fun." Yeah. So. Different strokes for different folks. Well, and you know, the thing is, too, I came off of a V-Strom, which wasn't any type of, you know, spectacular experience either, but it's just that I, the V-Strom, I was comfortable on, and I had a lot of miles on it, and I spent a lot of time on that bike, so I really liked it a lot. And when it came out, I had one of the first ones down here, you know, it was kind of weird. No one knew what it was. You know, the whole adventure touring class was dominated by BMW, and that was it. Yeah. So when... People like that, and then of course Honda in Europe, you know, with Trans Alps and Africa Twins that have been around for a long time. Um, you know, that the the V-Strom was kind of cool. It was a neat thing to have, but 
that's one of the reasons why I like the Gucci so much is just because they're like you know you have this visceral connection to the to the motor the whole thing vibrates it's kind of like riding you know an R bike a BMW but it's there's more to it and uh, there's a sound there's you know the feel it's just it's just something that presses the right buttons for me. The yeah. the, the Super Tenere, you know, I have a buddy that loves his. It's a great bike. They're really capable off road. It just again, it didn't really do anything for me. Now the Multi Strat, on the other hand, you know, <laughs> that's a bike I really like a lot. But it, it just there was so, the 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 comorbidity to that bike. You know, the 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 death knell for me on that was the cost of service. Yeah. So it's expensive to own. The cost of ownership is high. I know that they changed the the intervals on the valve adjustments on the newer bikes, but still, it's an expensive bike. And it it had a chain. I'd rather have uh, the shaft. Speaking of that class of bike, um, MV Agusta came out with a new bike that uh, I thought... Me personally thought it looked really cool. It's their um, Turismo. I'm just pulling it up right now. Yeah. Veloce. That is an interesting machine. Yeah, I like it. The 800 yeah. cc triple motor thingy. Yeah. It's an inline three. Mm. <laughs> I like the I like the only thing I I'm not I don't really like is the exhaust but the exhaust is strange the angle of those rear panniers is extreme yeah it sure is isn't it looks like they're put on wrong <laughs> yeah you take those off for a second and just look at the rest of the lines on the bike I think it's kind of cool okay I think there's yeah, actually a couple yeah, shots in here without the panniers you know. Hmm. That one I'll have to look, I'll have to give that a little further um, scrutiny. One of our compatriots over at the pace thinks this thing's ugly, and but then again, you know, he likes the the CTX, so it's really kind of a personal styling thing. And hmm. this bike I like. I think it's cool. Again, I don't know what something like this. I don't see it costing anywhere here yet. I know from that the. From the very front, it strikes me similar to the old Multistrada. Right. The pre-Beak Multistrada. If it was a little more rounded, it would look exactly like one. Not that bike I didn't like at all. I There, there was nothing. I just couldn't get into that. This one I kind of like. I think it's kind of neat. It's definitely different. I think the thing that's throwing it off for me in these pictures is it's up on a rear stand, and that rear wheel is quite a ways off the ground. Yeah. And so it's not even sitting level. Um, I didn't even think about that. You really got to... Let me just tilt the whole computer to one side so I can see what it looks like. But Yeah. Yeah, it's still it's still a pretty extreme angle on a lot of those lines, you know? Yeah, but I think it, it that threw it off for me anyway. And those taillights are great. The taillights have that, like, Ducati uh, Panigale kind of LED squiggle yeah. thing going on. It's got a color display, which is pretty cool, too. The TFT display is in color. Yeah. Huh. You know, and calling these things ADV bikes, I think, is a stretch. For Definitely. This the Multistrada. They're just... I don't know if it maybe would fit, like, in a subclass, you know, where you have the, the sport tourings and then super sports... This is like an upright sport tourer. Yes, I mean, I don't know. Again, it's just something I like. Yeah, I tend to gravitate gravitate toward the Italian bikes. So, just maybe it's the styling of them that I always like. And you know, well, I tend to gravitate toward the British bikes. So. Yeah, you look at bikes like the. Kawasaki's, especially their their 1000 series, you know, like the Z1000. Yeah. I just can't. To me, I just don't like the styling of those things. I know there are guys that that love them, but this silver one, 
does it, I think, looks better. Did this, you go to Envy's website? Is that what you're looking at? I'm actually at? on psychoworld.com. Um, okay. They have like a 34 photo spread. Um, and I'm just clicking through them. And I, the silver one, there's a, there's a shot from the side of the silver one without the panniers on it. And I... What's that movie with the spaceship that abducts the little kid? They're not really abducts. The little kid flies around in the spaceship. Oh, uh, the Flight of the Navigator? Yeah, Flight of the Navigator. Yeah. That's what this bike makes me think of. <laughs> it's got that kind of like aerodynamic, curvy, um, like organic shape to it. That thing looked like a flat egg in that movie. <laughs> kind of. I don't know. That, that's just what I think of when I see this. Maybe I'm getting spacecraft mixed up from another movie, another movie, but I'm definitely... I don't know. You know, like I said, I think this like, thing's probably going to be expensive, but... So... Yeah, apparently, Benelli's got... A, a, a 600 twin that uh, I don't know if it's going to be available for the U.S. market though or not. They've got a oh well, there's a 300 the the BN 302. Did you see that? No, not yet. And they got a BN 600 GT, but uh, the GT is a sport tour. That's not it. I googled it and I found the wrong thing. Well, that's odd looking. It's just got like a big freight. It's like a big front end. Like at least the one that what I the picture looking that I'm at? looking. Uh, 2014 Benelli BN 600 GT. Okay, that's a that's a different bike. Oh, that's the one that I was talking about. Wait, we're not we're, we're you're. You've got me confused now. You're, we're off of the uh, what you call it already, right? The yeah. MV. You're, you went to the Benelli. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So but this bike's BN... made in China. I didn't realize that. The BN is a four-cylinder bike, though. Yeah. No. The the three hundred or the three o three o two three o two is the two-cylinder. I'll look it up. Not three ninety two. Darn inability BN to type. Oh, that looks completely different. <laughs> yeah. Huh. All right. It's got that nit strange little side-mounted shock thing going on. Mm. And this one is a terrible color of orange. Yeah. Yeah, that's a gross... That's a, coming from a guy who's got an orange bike, but... Well, I mean, this thing, it's like the... The, like... Search and rescue orange. I just don't. And the, the the seat's kind of weird too, isn't it? It's like yeah. it's yeah. More that it's just, almost. There's just one seat. picture that I can find of it. I haven't found any other any other pictures of it. Yeah, same here. Yeah, but it's it, the seat's kind of like scooterish again, flat and wide looking. Yeah. Speaking of scooters, would you own one? I mean, like, are you a scooter guy? I would absolutely own one. Um under certain criteria. Like, I'd really like an old vintage Vespa or Lambretta. Um, or even, I, I'd be okay with a newer Vespa, um, but it definitely has to be that retro-styled scooter. Like, mm -hmm. um, the James from the Pace has that uh, C3, the Yamaha C3. Right. And, I mean, that thing is like a, a, a cooler with wheels. Yeah, I saw that. I was looking at that, because he was talking about the other day not being able to flat foot it. So I wanted to see how wide the thing was. Yeah, um, and I don't, I don't think I'd like that so much. But I would totally ride like a little, you know. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of like the stuff. Bergman type looking things, you know. No. But but a retro type scooter to me, like a, especially a Lambretta, I think those things are great. Um, I'd have one of those. Yeah, that, uh, you know, it, it's just there's no there's no really place, if I lived in like an area that had like a small downtown area or something like that, then I'd have yeah. one just to commute, but it's not conducive to that here. Yeah, same here. I mean, I, really, like where I live, I could ride to work on it, but I'm not going to live here for much longer. 
Yeah, I don't think San Diego is a place where you, unless you were living right next to the base, you know, yeah. on Coronado, but I don't know. I hey, don't so, cash. Yeah. <laughs> I was there. I know what it you know, was expensive. So I want to throw this out to the listeners and see if we can get some feedback on it. Um, I, I've been, you know, you and I have had this discussion. I've been thinking about getting rid of all my DSLR camera equipment. So, for those of you who don't know, I kind of an amateur, semi-pro photographer back in the 80s and 90s. I did photography for a fire department-based magazine called Code 3, and that led to me stringing for one of the local newspapers here, which led to me getting some stuff with UPI, and then I've had some stock images with uh, Getty, and I've done some stuff for some magazines, and I did a a TV show for interiors for a while, but I never, you know, really did anything that I cared about other than for myself to hang in the house, and I've got some Canon DSLR equipment that when I, I realized when I went to Barber, this stuff is heavy, yeah. and carrying it around is heavy, and uh, I've been kicking around the idea of getting a micro four-thirds camera, because the quality is really phenomenal and they've made some huge uh, leaps in the lenses that are available that being said there's a photographer down here that posted some images um, on the ADV forum on a trip that he did by motorcycle to Alaska he did like 20,000 miles over the summer this year the guy's name is Ricardo Serpa and the images when I first saw him, I was like, wow, this is really cool. And I went to his his website for his studio, and it talked about the fact that he used Nikons and Leicas. So I thought certainly that those images were a combination of both. And when somebody on the thread that he had posted on had made mention that, you know, what camera did you shoot with the Nikon or the Leica? And he was like, no, it was actually an Olympus Four Thirds camera. Hmm. So I was, it was kind of impressed. Now, for me, not giving a crap about ever wanting to sell anything again and just wanting to have things that it's either going to be on the internet or at home printed, I'm thinking this might be the way to go. And you could easily carry one of these things in a tank bag with two lenses without a problem and cover yeah. the whole entire range. So I'm just curious to see if we get any feedback on guys that m might have done the same thing, might have went from a DSLR to a four-thirds system, and if not you know, maybe the, the pros and cons, why you would say don't. I've already had one person tell me, well, don't get rid of your le your legacy lenses because you can use them on the four-thirds camera. The whole reason for me wanting to get rid of the the DSLR is the weight of the lenses. You know, my L-series Canon lenses are heavy. Yeah. And I just, you know, my shoulder and neck were killing me walking around all day long, carting around that 70 to 200, 28 at Barber. So, um... Olympus makes a, what was it, a 12 to, I think a 24 to 8, which, you know, is a 24 to, it, it's two times magnification on the four-third sensor, and they're coming out with the equivalent of, um, I think it's going to be like a f 70 to 300 to 8, you know. So those two lenses there in a body, but... Just curious to see if anybody's got any uh, any feedback on that. Yeah, I, I'm an absolute photography noob, so I can offer no meaningful commentary. <laughs> yeah, you know, in, in the discussions that you see take place with photography on the forums mirror the discussions you see take place in the motorcycle forums. Like if you get to discussion on synthetic versus, you know, dyno lube or... yeah. Just anything like that. It, when you talk about sensor size, you know, four thirds compared to full frame and APS-C, I have every expert in the world commenting on it. To me, I, it doesn't matter. I care less. It's just I want a nice picture hanging in the house to remind me of a trip I went on or something that I saw. And uh, I'm just curious if anybody has any feedback on the the cameras themselves, the four thirds system. Yeah. But, so let uh, us know. Um... 
the usual places, facebook.com slash catfairacerpodcast, um, catfairacerpodcast at gmail.com for now. We're working on a We have a Twitter account. Email address. Yeah, we do. Um, yeah. Thanks to you. I don't remember yeah. what it is. Cafe Racer Pod. That's right. Um, so pretty soon we'll have to amend our cans little outro and get all that stuff fixed. We got an Instagram account coming up too, so as soon as we have that, I'll we'll post it on the uh, the Facebook page. Yeah. Speaking of things coming up, um, I've still you got some interviews at AIM Expo that um, I've yet to do anything with, process, and get pushed out as an episode. That'll probably happen sometime this week, um, maybe early next week. Plus, um, an interview with uh, Jamie Robinson coming up. Um, I talked to him today, thanks again to Stephen putting the feeler out there, and then time zone-wise it just works out better for me to interview him than, than for you because he and I live on the same coast. <clears throat> um, so we're going to do that, and then I got, a, I got a box full of stuff to give away from the Cafe Racer TV show. So you we're gonna guys be, are going to have to work for it, though. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're going to be coming up yeah. with something for you guys to do to um, something diabolical to earn some some stuff I've got I'm not going to give it all away but there are DVDs and other asso- associated swag in there so definitely some cool stuff looking for coming looking sorry brain shut down cool stuff to look forward to coming up um, and I got a cool little t-shirt out of the deal too so <laughs> We're going to hopefully have, uh, I'm hoping that we get some gear in soon to test for you guys to let you know how it, how it, uh, how it works out, but the, especially the, the bell, because you you have experience in a 500 that wasn't stellar, so. Yeah. I mean, I, I still, I, I've worn it from here to Seattle several times, um, and so it's not like, it's not unwearable. But How far is that from you? So, yeah. Hour and a half. Um, so there's some there's some interesting stuff that I've been reading about going on there with like garage nights. I'm gonna have to send you some links. Hmm. There's like a Wednesday night thing. Oh, you, you mean know, Backfire uh, Moto? Is, I don't know if it's Backfire Moto. Is that the one that Stormy Ray does? Um, the name doesn't sound familiar, but um, it's Backfire Moto is a every third Wednesday of the month um thing in Seattle. And that's another interview that I'm working on trying to get taken care of. We were going to do it, and then I went to San Diego. So, Okay. But, uh, yeah, the guy Todd, I know him that, that, that runs that. It's sort of like a giant meetup. Um, I mean, we, there, there have been six, 700 bikes there a few times. There's something else that goes on there. It's some, it's some builder or a shop, and I think it's a weekly event, but I... I I'll have to find out. and cause It's funny because every time I see something really cool, I'm like, crap, that's in Seattle. Yeah, it's not too far. It's, it's, it's not too far for me to get to depending on what time of day they do it. I mean, that's, a lot, that's a long drive for a bike night. Yeah, I've, I've done the drive down to Backfire four, four times this year. Mm. Um, you stay there or you come home? I come home. I get home late and then right. get up early in the morning and I'm super Speaking tired. Speaking of that, i got to get up in like three hours. Yeah, I was going to say, you should probably uh, <laughs> pack it in. It's 1.30 my time. Yeah, I, I glanced down at my clock a minute ago. I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> yeah. So, All right. Um, <clears throat> since those of you who are watching the video aren't going to get our handy-dandy little canned outro... Uh, just see our previous statements about the Facebook page and the email address and the Twitter account. Um, and you can also follow me directly on Twitter at Cafe Racer X. Um, what else? You, there's your Twitter account. Steven Grasso is my Twitter account. And that's also the same thing for my Instagram, but we'll, uh, we'll get the Cafe Racer Instagram going too. Give us a like on uh, Facebook, on our Facebook page, and... Uh, if you like the show or if you don't like the show, give us a review on iTunes. You know, if there's anything we can do better, let us know. Yeah, like the intro. 
Um, I could probably do the <laughs> intro better, especially twice in a row watching it on the video. And it's not going to be any better for the audio because I'm not going to go fix that. <laughs> I'm glad you're doing it and not me because I'm nowhere near as smooth as you are. You've got the radio voice, man. I just well, I, I get this like right as I was starting to talk, a little notification came up on the screen, and so like it was just enough to throw me off. <laughs> Because <laughs> my brain goes, what? What is that? Oh wait, now I don't remember what I'm saying. So um, now you gotta close your eyes, like you're yeah, in a, in a studio much. or something. Um, so yeah, I think that's about it. There's, like I said, there's some more stuff in the works. We're gonna be changing some stuff around, um, advertisement-wise, sponsorship-wise. Uh, <sighs> prices will change. Um, so yeah, and. and uh, policies maybe a little bit so if you're looking to get in an ad um, definitely just just give us a, a holler before you plunk down a whole bunch of change uh, to try to pay for you know a 12 season a 12 episode run of ads just just give us a heads up first that's, are we gonna change the name this the subtitle of our show to be cafe racer podcast the only motorcycle internet podcast where the two hosts have never met each other <laughs> yeah right um I would really prefer not to have to change it to Cafe Racer Podcast, a show about ads with some Cafe Racer stuff thrown in. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not we'll that we don't we'll... like the sponsors. Um, and those sponsors that have uh, have already uh, thrown some money our way, we are extremely grateful and we love all of you. Um, but w things are changing, constantly evol evolving, so uh, keep a lookout. Yep, 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 yep. And we're going to be riding more, too. So now that you're done, you know, doing unimportant things like work. I know. It's yeah, terrible. yeah. So hopefully uh, I'm going to miss my bike night coming up next week because I'm leaving to go on vacation tomorrow for a little short vacation. And then, um, but the more riding that we do, I'll hopefully I'll get more photos for you guys. I'm trying to attend some of these local events and uh, go talk to some local guys that are building bikes too and get some more photos up. Yeah, anyway. I'm probably going to miss my bike night too because it's freaking cold outside. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you yeah, you been, might get to do more riding. I'll probably do a lot less. No, that's now. been freezing here. I think it was like 72. Oh, so man. That's I've been looking terrible. for the winter gear, yeah. It was like... 30 something. I got to go find my idiot mittens. <laughs> <laughs> we were we were down in San Diego, you know, standing outside in the sun at, you know, it's like 75, 80 degrees outside. Pull out my phone and go, "Huh, it's 46 degrees and raining at home right now." I guess yeah, there are uh, advantages to being down here. You're going to like San Diego. The weather's beautiful all the time. Yeah, I think so too. So, uh, thanks for listening everybody. Uh, yep. Take it See easy. You again.